We'll settle in. In a moment, we'll do our refuge chant. I put it into the chat for those of you online. People in the room here, of course, we have copies up front if you need them. Establishing mindfulness to the fore. And taking the time to sense directly in your experience the wholesomeness of non-distraction, present moment awareness. And we remember that we're going to be taking up the exclusive attention to the breathing process as a support, right? We wanna follow the thread of this pleasure of non-distraction. Feels good to be present. So let's use the ordinary rhythm physicality of breathing in and breathing out as a way to keep the present moment in mind.
So it's that recognition that breathing in is being felt here and now in the present moment. And breathing out is being experienced, being felt here and now in the present moment. And appreciating, it's subtle, but we're learning to appreciate the subtle pleasure of non-distraction, of being present. And having an object like the ordinary process of breathing in and out, it's just a skillful means that supports the continuity of present moment awareness or non-distraction. So in that way, we understand it really doesn't have anything to do with the particular breath. So we can abandon the habit of wanting to control or fix the breath. And each of us in our own way, we'll have to figure out if we could use uh, additional support, like using a meditation phrase, it could be as simple as breathing in and then breathing out, or even simply the word in, out, knowing the breath, letting the breath be. But these are supports when they're needed, when they're useful. If you don't need it, then don't use it. And we're learning to sense this, what's called in Buddhism, this unworldly pleasure of seclusion. It's a particular kind of pleasure that's more about what's not here in the mind. So distractedness isn't here. And that experience of non-distraction has a particular flavor that we want to get to know. Remembering to relax. And just even more generally to appreciate the wholesomeness of studying the mind.
learning how to put everything else down and simply be aware of breathing in, breathing out, with everything else just falling into the background. And when there is a clearer sense of this wholesome pleasure of seclusion, it's really the flavor or pleasure of simplicity, then you can shift to the next instruction from the Buddha. One trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing the whole body. One trains oneself while breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And you can, at least from time to time, you can repeat that instruction as you're breathing in, breathing out, if it's helpful, or just remind yourself when needed. And we're not relating to the body in the way we might normally relate to the body, where we pay attention to places that hurt, places we want to fix. But we're relying on that pleasure of seclusion so we can open to the totality of the body without playing favorites, just feeling the whole body together as you breathe in and feeling then the whole body together as you breathe out. So the neutral sensations, the pleasant sensations, the unpleasant sensations, everything belongs. It's not about using the awareness to fix the body, to work through the physical knots that we might feel. It's really more about this unconditional acceptance. Yeah, the body's like this as we breathe in. Yeah, the body's like this as we breathe out. We're still following that thread, that pleasure of seclusion. But now we're doing doing it with a more inclusive awareness of the body. Keeping the body in mind.
staying close to the body, this inclusive, generous presence with the whole body as you breathe in, as you breathe out. And it will be felt as a kind of gift to the body, this unconditional, open, sensitive presence. And eventually the body will respond with a kind of healing. It's really a healing of the mind-body relationship. So it doesn't mean that the body physically heals, but the mind that's knowing the body, that relationship becomes really beautiful. And it's felt as a kind of well-being in the body, a calmness in the body. And we learn to keep it in mind. This is the fourth instruction from the Buddha. One trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing calm in the body, experiencing that embodied well-being. And one trains oneself while breathing out, experiencing that calm in the body. And we're learning to sense it wherever we sense it, but also sense how, how it begins to spread, how it begins to be felt more and more throughout the body. But you're not trying to make something happen. We're just interested in that sense of calm and well-being in a bodily sense. Just do the best you can. So the real learning in step number four is how to be interested in that sense of well-being, bodily well-being, as opposed to the more common thing the mind would be interested in is where there's pain or where there's a problem. So we have to train the mind to be interested in that sense of bodily calm wherever, however it's being felt now. Being interested in that embodied calm, embodied well-being. Giving it permission to spread, widen, and deepen. It's 
really this experience of the mind not being in conflict with the body, bodily experience. And you might even sense it as a kind of standing back. So instead of being immersed in the body, there's this wise and loving awareness of the body that in a sense stands back. Bodies like this, this loving, patient, sensitive, understanding that the body's like this and it's okay that it's like this. Body as nature happening on its own. And there can arise and we can learn to notice the kind of joy a buoyant sense that everything is happening, moving, happening on its own. And even older or <clears throat> less than wholesome patterns of reactivity or whatever, it's also happening on its own. It's a, begin to notice that inner smile of joy, rapture, just the sense of the body, the heart, the mind, as this activity, this movement, Sensing the frictionlessness of the present moment. So the fifth instruction, you might remember, one trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing joy. And one trains oneself while breathing out, experiencing joy that lightness or buoyancy, that bright, joyful interest. It's really the opposite of boredom. this natural desire to be close, to be intimate, and to feel and sense how everything is moving, unfolding, dancing, coming and going. And this subtle sense of, I don't have to manage it, I don't have to own it, I don't have to contain it, hold it in any way. Some people might experience it as a great vibratory ocean. So the sense of the body and the mind has more this vibratory quality, just alive.
And again, it can be helpful for some of you at sometimes to use the word joy. Even the phrase experiencing joy as you breathe in, experiencing joy as you breathe out, just as a prompt or a little support for keeping joy in mind as best you can. And instead of being immersed in the joy, it can be a a stepping back. So knowing that there is joy as you breathe in and knowing that there is joy as you breathe out. And you might begin to detect a more resonant happiness, sukha, this deep, easeful pleasure of the heart, contentedness, and even a sense of relaxation of the heart. Sometimes I use the phrase ease of heart as I'm breathing in, as I'm breathing out, and just trusting there is this capacity this ease of heart, this contentedness. The heart more deeply trusting everything as it is. And the pleasure of that, of not having to be a doer, doing something, fixing something, getting somewhere. But instead just Tuning in to the ease of the heart as you breathe in. And tuning in to the ease of the heart as you breathe out. Really valuing this ease, this inner happiness. And when that quality of sukha, ease of the heart, when it's really strong, you might notice this deep sense of not needing to move, not wanting to go anywhere, not needing to become anybody. So a deeper sense of contentment, contentment with the conditions as they are.
And as we've been doing to transition to the next step, instead of being immersed in that sense of ease, there's a sense of standing back and knowing that ease is being known, being felt as you breathe in and out. And that ease, that pleasant quality is still there. Because of the strength of that pleasure, that contentedness. And it's easier to observe the normal, ordinary activity of the mind, thoughts, perceptions, feelings. But in this context of dispassion, not being dependent on our thoughts, not really being in need of thought. Yet thoughts may come and go because of the force of habit. But we can just observe, we don't have to have a problem with whatever thoughts, perceptions, or whatever mental activity comes and goes. So there's this spacious or dispassionate sensitivity to thoughts, but not feeling pushed around or not feeling bound by any of the mental activity. It's just that, it's just that activity of the mind doing what it does. And when mental activity is observed in this way, mental activity tends to become more and more quiet. So you might notice the quieting of the mind naturally. You're not trying to quiet it. You just have a dispassionate or spacious attitude about the activity of the mind. And just appreciating the relative quiet of the mind. even sensing the space between thoughts, between any mental activities. And just appreciating that spacious quality Good, so take a little time, adjust. And Chuck, if you wouldn't mind turning the top two, just slide the up a little bit higher, not too much. Maybe a little bit more. <laughs> Great. 
Thanks, Chuck. That's good. So nice to be here with everyone. Looks like we have about the same, you know, 40 or so in the room and 50 or so online. Nice to have our Buddhist studies community together and appreciative that Shelley was able to teach last Monday. And you probably notice we're moving into what's called the second tetrad, the second set of four instructions. And hopefully all of you have your copy or have already memorized the 16 steps, which I highly recommend. It's not that hard to do. And they just understand that the first set of four, it's really the mind. It's all about the mind, but the first set of four is the mind relating to the body. And the breath is just a subset of the body, right? And what's getting healed through the deepening of understanding and the training of the mind is a way the mind is learning how to be with the body, to be aware of the body, to be sensitive to the body in a way that heals the relationship of the mind knowing the body. That's a relationship. In a way, it's our primary relationship. And a lot of our other relationships are just reverberations of that. So if you're like, live some distance from your body, (laughs) it may be that that's how it is with you and your friends or you and your pet or you and your partner, you know, that we live some distance. Like we're in our idea of our friend, not actually in the intimacy and the wildness of the, the relationship. And then the next set of four instructions that we're going to work with tonight and next week, it's really about the mind that knows and its relationship to mental activity. So bodily activity, that's the first set of four. Everything's activity. (laughs) In a sense, you know, one of the discoveries in our practice, just being aware, cultivating clear seeing is there aren't any things, there are just activities, right? No nouns, just verbs, as someone once said. But our thinking process, right, imagining process, we imagine there are things, but they're just changing processes. That's our subjective experience. So when we're aware of the body, we're aware of the activity of the body, the activity of the breath, the activity of the whole body, then we're aware of the activity of the mind. And then we're going to be aware in the third tetrad, the space of the mind. Instead of what's moving in the mind, right? And more and more the empty nature of the mind. But we'll get there in in a couple weeks. But it's not easy to be aware of the activity of the mind because more than we take bodily activity personally and react you know, to sensation, the pleasantness of it or the unpleasantness of it, we are more, even more strongly in the habit of taking mental activity personally. So the whole point, right from the very beginning, and I've talked about this before, But we want to have a real, right from the start, it's that inner pleasure that really helps us move through the 16 steps. So even when we establish mindfulness to the four, which is even before the first step, it's kind of part of the setup in the way this uh, discourse is given. Establish mindfulness to the four. And even then we want to have a sense of, oh yeah, mindfulness It has a trustworthy feeling, effective feeling. And distractedness has an unpleasant and untrustworthy flavor to it. We want to get that sense. Because then we understand why I'm going to have this exclusive attention to the breath for a while. It's because I want to really explore 
the pleasure of being present. And if I give myself this crutch to be with the physicality of breathing in and breathing out, I'll, most of us will have more success building some continuity of present moment awareness because it's easy to notice when I get distracted because I'm not with my breath. That's the whole point, right? And so just tracking the physicality of breathing in and out and just like learning how to keep that one simple thing in mind, which is just a trick or a skillful means to non-distraction in the direction of non-distraction. Because if I'm keeping the breath in mind, I'm not getting lost in thought. And if I get lost in thought, I'm not keeping the breath in mind, right? So to sustain and deepen that pleasure of seclusion, of being present, then we use the breath. And we get a little bit more of like how nice it is to be present, to be, and it's really about what's not there. It's the absence of the agitation of distractedness. That's what's not there because that's not there, it's pleasant. Then the Buddha invites us, well, can we not only um, continue, but even strengthen the quality of seclusion, but now be more inclusive of the whole body? So less dependent on the anchor and more of this inclusive. And uh, we find, yeah, yeah, we can. Like, I don't need this simple environment of just being with the breath, the touching, the movement of the abdomen, whatever helps you. But I can have this more general opening. But, I, but I'm learning how to keep the present moment in mind, keep the body in mind as I breathe in, as I breathe out. And the Buddha is setting us up for a more resonant pleasure which is this embodied calm, this embodied well-being. The mind that isn't trying to fix the body, isn't trying to judge or control or manage the body. The knowing mind is allowing the body to be, the activity of the body, the sensations. It's allowing. It's open and allowing. And that feels good. The relationship feels good. If you have a bad knee, you still have a bad knee. But what dominates our subjective experience is the health of the mind's relationship, the mind that's knowing the bodily activity. That stands out. And we keep that in mind, that embodied calm, that embodied well-being. Because it's the mind that's knowing that's calm, right? The body is just the body, you know. We have to understand because it gets confused. And there are even Buddhist teachers that um, I think use language in a way that can be confusing about the body. Like it's all about the body. But remember from day one, we're having an experience of the mind. It's the mind that is experiencing. The body doesn't experience. The body doesn't feel. The mind feels. The mind knows. The mind experiences. So it's always we are (laughs) having a mind experience. That's all we ever get. And the mind knows the spectrum from gross, the body, to subtle, the mind. It knows the mind too, can know the mind, the mental activity and the absence of mental activity, right? And that whole spectrum from gross to subtle is being known by the mind. So when we get to that third and fourth instruction, uh, breathing in, you know, we're training, the Buddha adds with that third step, one trains oneself and then that continues through most of the 16, one trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And then the fourth, one trains oneself while breathing in, calming 
bodily activities, bodily formations. But really it's about, uh, it's not so much that we're calming, but we're uh, discovering or uncovering a heart, a mind that can be with the body in a way that is calm, that has this embodied sense of calm and well-being. So we're really experiencing the mind that is okay with the body. And you know, it's not that way. It's a little bit like with some of our relationships that even the people we love the most, we're always sort of tweaking it, like wanting them to be slightly different (laughs) than they are. You know, even with our pets, you know, we're, we're controlling in that way. But when we really accept a friend, a lover or whatever, really, really don't need them to be different than they are, it's such a nice moment. Because that's real unconditioned, conditional love. Because the heart, the mind's not holding back in those moments. So it's a little bit like that in that fourth step. The mind's not holding back in its presence, in its loving and wise presence, integrated, intimate, sensitive presence with what we call the body, embodiment. And that, that it requires obviously a lot of trust, right? That's the healing process from, we're basically going from you know, and it's understandable the mistrust we have of the body because of the, our subjective experience. It, it really feels like my body is really bothering me. <laughs> you know, it's like out to get me sometimes. These things, these pestering things that can go wrong in our body. And so when there's not that going on, it's like when we really trust the body, then it it starts to affect generally how the mind is knowing this reality, the present moment, things as they are. And there's, uh, because of the, the greater trust, then uh, there's a word, it wasn't used a lot in the uh, Pali Canon and the early texts, although the Buddha used it to, um, it's how he designated himself. You know, he referred to himself as the Tathagata. I don't know if people know that. It's an interesting word. Later Buddhist traditions kind of made a big deal out of the root of that word Tata, which is uh, like in later Buddhist traditions, it would be translated as thusness or suchness. It's kind of one of those strange, like what does that mean, suchness? Things as they are. But it's, um, it's kind of an aliveness, You know what I mentioned a little bit earlier in the talk, how everything is happening on its own. Everything is activity. And essentially, you know, what appears to us subjectively as friction, you know, being tight with the activity of my mind, like I think a thought, ooh, I don't want to think that thought. And and we have this seeming capacity to create friction, or I don't want to feel that sensation, or I don't want to hear that sound or I really want to hear that sound, you know, and we create this appearance of friction of liking and not liking. But when we have a deeper trust of the present moment, like we start to get with that embodied well-being, the fourth step, more trust, then if we're instructed like we are by the Buddha in, in step number five, one trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing joy. One trains oneself while breathing out, experiencing joy. And this is where we are now to have to develop a sincere interest in what the heck does the Buddha mean by piti, rapture, joy, bright, joyful interest, rapt. You know, it's like the mind is really there, like ah, wonder. It's really there because it's sensing something that's 
apparently here and now, and even the sense, the intuitive sense, has always been here and now, but that the mind that I have been missing. And it's related to this word, tata, or, you know, the Buddha called himself one, you know, it's almost like he's saying, you know, instead of I'm Mark, he's saying, I am this suchness. I am j this activity without friction, right? It's kind of nice. <laughs> I mean, I could aspire. I like that. You know, I'd like to aspire to be the activity free of all friction, like a free fall, except there's nothing to hit. Uh, Joseph, some of you know this story because it gets told so many times. I forget in what context Joseph Goldstein told this story, but it's like somebody throws you out of an airplane and you realize you don't have a parachute and you're freaking out, freaking out, freaking out, freaking out, freaking out, and then eventually you realize there's no ground to hit. And then what's that experience? It's like uh, that sense of... Uh, not being bound by gravity or, you know, just who knows. So that's what we're looking for. That's kind of our homework now that as we're transitioning to the next uh, set of inst four instructions, and it's really important to get interested in this wholesome, you know, and I know it's a little weird to say this, but in the tradition we refer to it as a unworldly pleasure, right? Even from the beginning, you know, that pleasure of non-distraction. And unworldly just means it's more about what's not there. Like I was saying earlier with the first four, the absence of distractedness is something, but it's really more about the absence of distraction than the continuity of present moment awareness. And so here it's really um, the absence, you know, relatively speaking, not perfect, the relative absence of the mind projecting friction on the free activity of the body and mind or the free activity of this moment. So that's what we're sensing when we take up that fifth instruction, one breathes in, one trains oneself while breathing in, experiencing joy, we're trying to sense in, a, <clears throat> in the field of our experience, <clears throat> anywhere in the body and the mind, this, right? We're trying to sense the activity of this free of friction. Just like, and that's why I mentioned in the guided sit, like it can be useful to, uh, to attune the attention to like a vibratory, energetic, flow, buzz, wherever you might feel that bodily, mentally. Just how, because <clears throat> what it evokes in how the mind relates, like as the mind learns to trust this is, everything's happening, everything's already happening. Whatever it is that's happening seems to know what it's doing. Doesn't need a sense of a somebody doing something, holding it all, managing it all. <coughs> so we're, this is why that term, tata, suchness, you know, the way, it's just the way it is. But it's really moving, shifting from a, uh, an experience that's dominated by concept that, concepts and ideas and language that gives things an appearance of solidity that they don't actually have. Reality, this, the present moment, is flow. It isn't a bunch of things. <laughs> you know, they even get this in uh, quantum mechanics, which I, you know, I'm not an expert, of course, and, but just the basic point I wanna make is, like, uh, we can, you know, in terms of the subtle experiments physicists do, you can understand things as things, you know, protons, or as waves, which really, they're not things, <laughs> waves, 
right? They're, it's energy or, you know, but it's, we don't really understand it because mostly we've been in this world of things because we're mostly in the world that language constructs for us. And we're learning to come into this new world we call the present moment, right? And that's really, and, and what we're learning to do is feel the pleasure of it because the pleasure will be really important. The joy, which is really a more that sense of uh, like the mind is really interested, that joyful interest, that bright, like, wow. That's why a smile can be nice. Like even, not actually a smile, but you can even do a subtle smile. But the idea of a smile can help you in this transition from four to five. Just to sense that the mystery, whatever the mystery is, it's here. It's the only place it is. It's not later. It's always here. And that makes the mind bright. And then, and we feel it almost like a ocean of, uh, like everything is just this ocean of vibration. And, you know, it's always a little uh, problematic when someone like me just says something like that, because then you look for that experience. Everyone's got to find their own experience. But I'm just kind of different things that might help you connect with your own experience. But the the key is to really initially bathe, immerse, trust, let it spread, let it, so that sense of joy is touching, being touched, everything, nothing left untouched. And then it's always like we've been doing, we step back from it, we realize joy is being known. And the example in, um, in Venerable Analio's book, maybe some of you are reading it, it's really that chapter, it's like a late 50s through the 60, page 60s. Um, you might want to reread this week. Remember that link that I'm putting in the email? That book is now, when Venerable Analio wrote the book with the publisher, he negotiated that after a certain number of years, he could have the PDF up online for freely for free use. So you, you get the book, which is great. You get the digital version of the book. So you can just go to those pages, that chapter, because uh, <clears throat> he talks about joy, piti, happiness, sukha, what I'm calling ease of heart, and then the awareness of mental activity with dispassion. That's, uh, let's see, five, six, seven. And then eight is the quieting of the mind. These are the four things we're paying attention to, joy, this happiness, this inner happiness of contentment, of ease of the heart, this dispassionate awareness of mental activity. So now we're, it's an important discovery that I don't have to be bothered by thought. Thoughts are just more activity. They're neither good nor bad. And that relationship to thought quiets mental activity. It's that spacious, non-dependence on mental activity that actually quiets the mind. Not wanting your mind to be quiet, that doesn't quiet the mind. But being really intimate with mental activity, but in this non-dependent way, not being pushed around by it, but not being bothered by it, neither for it nor are you against thoughts. That's what quiets the mind. And then we appreciate that quiet and that will set up step nine that we'll get to in a couple of weeks, which is noticing, you know, you could just say the space, not the activity, but the space of the present moment. What is this when it's not dominated by bodily experience and our reaction to bodily experience and not dominated by mental activity? What is this any moment? Well, we don't know because there's always bodily experience we're reacting to, and there's always thoughts we're reacting to, mental activity, perceptions. and But when that stuff goes quiet, then what is this, the experience? 
Well, that's the third tetrad, the third set of four instructions. Experiencing the mind, gladdening the mind, concentrating, stilling the mind, releasing the mind are the four steps there. And feel free, I mean, a lot of you have practiced the, this before. <clears throat> I've taught it several times in the last four years just because it's really a useful map to learn about all the other teachings that come up you know, from the Buddha's 45 years of teaching. Um, it's really helpful. But the, before we break into the small groups tonight, I want to make that point again because it's so important all the way through. Like if you really take up one of the instructions and then the transition to the next instruction usually involves a kind of stepping back as Ajahn, or as uh, Saida, <laughs> as Venerable Analio says, um, this German monk who wrote the book that um, is one of our texts. In that book, he talks about you want to step back and realize that whatever you were paying attention to and really immersing, being intimate with, now you're stepping back and you're realizing it's something being known. That's just something being known. And that sense of space, that kind of cooler relationship, not indulging in what you were previously paying attention to, that opens us, the mind, to the next step, whatever it is. So really immerse yourself in the joy, and then you realize, breathing in, it's just joy being known. Breathing out, joy is just being known. It's just this experience being known. And that, then, then in a sense, feeling the effect of that joy, which is a greater trust, which is a more resonant happiness. That's the sukha. It's like a pure mental pleasure, and it's related to tranquility, mental tranquility, as opposed to the bodily tranquility that we experience at step four. And it has a very specific flavor. And I mentioned it, you know, like the word with the word contentment, but another really interesting experience to unpack, to get familiar with, is that sense of being held. Like really, both energetically, physically, but even mentally, not wanting to move. The mind is so content, it doesn't, the sense of a doer wanting to do something gets suppressed in a skillful way. And the, the experience is a sense of a, a pleasant sense of being held. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, and that's okay. It's very healing to rest in that place. And then we step back from it because we want to sense, because what that grows, that, that immersion in sukha, the ease of the heart, what that sets in motion then is a sense of, it's such a healing pleasure that it really shifts the mind's relationship to thought because thoughts you know, mostly are driven by greed and aversion. And we use mental activity to take care of this hungry ghost of ourself, you know, this person that's discontent and is looking for real satisfaction. But now the strong experience of ease, of sukha, then that really goes quiet, that hungry ghost. So now thought we can have a, a dispassionate relationship to mental activity. And that's really helpful. It changes our relationship. And to really get to that place where you see nobody's having a problem with mental activity. It's just thought. Like Joseph Goldstein, one of my teachers, said, somebody left a radio on, and it's totally fine, you know. And maybe it's even in a foreign language, the radio station. But it's not a problem. It's just like bird sounds, you know. We get used to them. We don't have to turn the bird sounds into a problem. So let's leave it there for tonight. And then for your small group conversations, um, remember just to, this is a non-optional part of the class. 
and really strongly encourage people to be part of the community. Remember, you can always pass, create these little 15, 20 minute sacred spaces where each person has a chance to share whatever you've been learning, what's been frustrating, what's felt useful or deepening. And in particular around um, the embodied calm and well-being, both in your formal practice, but other places in your life where you've really been able to have experienced that sense of the mind really in this wise and loving, intimate relationship with the body. And that good feeling that comes from that. And then <clears throat> your own relationship to joy, because you know we have all kinds of strange relationships to joy, like I don't deserve joy. And we almost can be mistrusting when joy comes our way, even ordinary sense joy, like we get what we wanted, get the birthday present we wanted, and it's like, you know, it's probably going to break. We don't really let it land because we're afraid of being betrayed by it. So it's nice to kind of, both in this more mundane level of sensual joy, but especially in this more spiritual joy, unworldly joy, to really just notice what effect does joy have on this life. It's a kind of medicine. Even worldly joy is a very useful medicine to know how to use in life. You know, like to watch a, a fun show, to really like being aware how the pleasure of the show can affect me. Being aware of it actually helps it do its work. Or you hang out with a friend, you know, but to be aware how much you're appreciating, you're enjoying. So to, it's like learning to be aware of enjoyment. It doesn't ruin the enjoyment. If it ruins the enjoyment, it's actually not joyful. Because we do a lot of things that we think are joyful and we don't really want to pay attention because we might realize the cost is greater than the pleasure or something like that. Yeah, so that's probably enough for to go on. And let me make Sue the... Uh,